Welcome everyone. I'm Deborah Winsheimer. I'm the COO of the Queen's Museum, and I'm delighted to welcome you here today. First, I want to welcome back those of you who have been with us since early this morning, and thank our partners for working so hard together to bring this forum here. The Temple Hoyne Buell Center of Study of American Architecture at Columbia University. Please stand up, friends, so we can thank you properly. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank The American Institute of Architects, New York, the Architecture Lobby, Francisco Casablanca, Gabriel Hernandez Solano, you can stand up, and everyone can stand up. <laughs> oh, there you are. Partner and partners, the very same designers who created the Rube Goldberg machine at the, the Rube Goldberg exhibition entrance, which is over there and my colleagues Adrian Coteen and Catherine Grau, who worked so hard today on our behalf. Thank you. <laughs> I also want to extend our thanks to all of today's invited speakers, including our elected representatives from Congressional District 14, Council Member Costa Constantinidis, Tanidis, I don't think he's here yet, State Senator Jessica Ramos, and Assembly Member Kata Cruz. And finally, I want to thank you all for taking the time this afternoon to participate in this important discussion, so thank you. Um, I thought I'd take a quick moment to introduce you to the history of this place, this building, and to explain why this particular location was chosen for our public assembly today. The Queen's Museum is housed in the last surviving building from the 1939 World's Fair, and this building was home to the United Nations General Assembly from 1946 to 1950, while the UN's headquarters were being built in Manhattan. It was then the New York City Pavilion for the 1960 World's Four World's Fair, and today the Queen's Museum serves as a community space dedicated to the history of our site the diversity of our community, and to showing exhibitions of contemporary artwork relating to both. And we have the distinct privilege of housing the panorama of the city of New York. Of the stunning relics from the 1964 World's Fair, including the Unisphere outside our door, the panorama is an incredible 10,000 square foot model featuring the whole of New York City, displaying 895,000 buildings and structures on a one to 1,200 scale. That one inch is 100 feet. And you really, I will not let you leave this building without seeing it. You must go see it today. <laughs> um, we started this day looking at the impacts of the Green New Deal gathered around the panorama, followed by workshops focusing on energy and power, transportation and power, and government and power. We're excited to begin this afternoon assembly where each of the working groups from this morning will help extend the conversations with you all. In fact, the work you see here in this central atrium by artist Pia Camille is an amazing example of recycling and reuse, and I encourage you to take a closer look as we move on with the day. So without further ado, I'd like to continue the program by calling up Gabriel and Francisco. I'm oh, sorry, our co-organizers. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's loud. Uh, thank you very much for coming. It's uh, uh, very exciting to see this finally come to fruition. We've been organizing this for a couple months now, or more. Um, and to see everyone come together is uh, very exciting. Also, just um, how far uh, the Green New Deal has come from when I started organizing for the Ocasio has been uh, amazing to see. I actually was at a, the first, one of the first climate change town halls in College Point. That's where I got to meet uh, Randy Abreu. Um, uh, Shoykat was there, Corbin Trent, their communications manager, Damon Drummer from New Consensus. And I was just there taking pictures, tabling, and kind of trying to understand what the Green New Deal meant. And we ended up getting a drink at the bar after. And it was the first time I had met them. And it was just so refreshing to see this like young group of thinkers, predominantly of color, uh, just talking about this stuff. To see these conversations happen in this tiny little bar in Queens, 
to now driving uh, the presidential primary in many ways and kind of defining the narrative, driving news cycles on a national scale has been very exciting to see, so. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, thank you for the Bill Center, Jacob, Reinhold, Larissa, Caitlin, and Deborah. Uh, also the architectural lobby. And um, yeah, I think just put, uh, giving a little more about that, both of us are architects, so we thought that as an architect, we had a responsibility to really organize the architecture community to, to, to talk about the Green New Deal, because uh, our plan was really to cut the tactical framing to really show the public that this is possible. But at the same time, we figured out that not only with the architect community uh, you know, can solve the problem. We need politicians. We need the community organization, we need everyone. And I think something that I learned during the past years, or this year, and uh, specifically with the, with the Congresswoman, is this, this is not about left or right, it's really about justice. And uh, justice is really have to be the driver because there's no price for justice. There's no, nobody can put a tag on justice. And it's not an ideology of left and right, it's, Justice is blind. So here I think that's the driver for public housing in the Green New Deal, for environmental justice, justice for Puerto Rico that, you know, need, uh, you know, being from hurricane colonized uh, country uh, uh, for hundreds of years. And I think we've been impacted in uh, greatly in terms of environmentally, physically, uh, as well as different uh, communities of color, indigenous. And I think for me, that's the driver that kind of uh, uh, make me, you know, with Gabriel, go out and organize with people and uh, bring everyone together to, yeah, to make a change and, and create justice. So now I think we're gonna show the video of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, our Congresswoman for New Year 14. Hello everyone, thank you for attending the Green New Deal Public Assembly. Special thanks to our partner hosts at the Queens Museum right here in New York's 14th Congressional District and Columbia University. I'm so excited that we're here talking today about the Green New Deal. And I think as we go through our conversations today, it's important to remember that ultimately the Green New Deal is centered on three core principles. The first is the full decarbonization of the U.S. economy. We have at, we are at the precipice, precipice of the climate crisis. And in order for us to do that, we need to mobilize our entire economy. So that's the core principle. The second core principle is a just transition for all frontline communities. And that just transition allows us to center the most impacted communities in the climate crisis and address issues of environmental injustice. And the third, of course, is to create millions of jobs in the process. Historically, uh, people, frankly, lots of folks from the fossil fuel industry has tr have tried to make environmental legislation anti-economic stimulus and anti-jobs legislation. We're here to reject that paradigm outright and to show that in order to decarbonize our community, we can, in we can infuse and center justice for the most impacted while creating millions of jobs in the United States of America. So from housing to energy policy, all of this is possible. We just need to create the policy to do it. How can the Green New Deal justly eliminate the use of fossil fuels? So one of the core principles of the Green New Deal, as I had mentioned, is the just transition. Uh, what a just transition does is that it, it brings in and centers the folks that would be impacted economically or otherwise by a given policy. And so what that means for us is that when we first proposed the Green New Deal, some of the first meetings that we took were with coal miners in order to figure out how we we're going to transition these communities and make sure that the jobs that are created are not just created in cities, but that they're also created in rural communities that really stand to lose uh, an industry if we transitioned away from coal. And some of the conclusions that we got from that, for example, was to include in the Green New Deal the fully funded pensions of coal miners 
for which, frankly, uh, big coal was actually trying to fight against. So it is entirely possible for us to create a just transition for those that would be economically impacted. How can the Green New Deal meaningfully avoid green gentrification? This is a really important question because historically, and this aligns with how economic injustice has been stratified, where the dirtiest and most polluted communities have been the poorest and the greenest, most energy efficient communities have been the richest. And what the Green New Deal seeks to do is to say that decarbonized buildings are not a luxury, but they are, they are frankly part of our view of health and health care as being a right. Nobody should be able to, sub, no one should be subjecting their child to higher asthma rates or even being exposed to lead exposure or cancer just because they are lower income. So what we do here is that we center, uh, going back to our, to our principles of centering frontline communities, we bring in folks. Uh, who from these communities to design solutions for themselves. And this is um, evident, especially in our most recent proposal this week with the Green New Deal for Public Housing, where public housing residents, along with experts and scientists, were able to come together and develop a transformational policy that centers public housing residents without displacing public housing residents. How can the Green New Deal equitably include frontline communities, workers, and non-U.S. citizens? Uh, you know, this is uh, another great question. One of the reasons that we're so excited about the Green New Deal is because this is exactly who the Green New Deal is creating economic opportunities for. It's for the working class of the United States. And because we're rooted in principles of universality, which means no ifs, ands, or buts in terms of who is included in our policy. We include absolutely everyone. And quite recently, um, in September, October, we introduced our Just Society legislation, which is also rooted in principles of universality, which means the systems that we're going to create and the systems that we advocate for, whether it's a federal jobs guarantee or whether it's Medicare for all, we are not adding any asterisks. If you are in the United States, you will be part of the prosperity that we're creating together. Can you give us a few concluding thoughts? You know, I think uh, one of the things that's so important uh, that we remember about the Green New Deal is that this is movement made. This is movement based public policy, and what movement based public policy means is that no one person has all the answers, myself included. And so what that means is that when we talk about the full decarbonization of the United States economy, every single person has a seat at the table and is capable of, of pushing and leading transformational change in any given sector of the economy. So I would just say, don't be afraid to step up and to step in, uh, whether you're passionate about regenerative agriculture, as some of our colleagues from Maine and other agricultural communities are passionate about, whether you're, you're passionate about energy policy, housing, healthcare policy, and low carbon work like childcare, which our economy is starting to transition largely to, please feel free to step up and play a role. Um, we will build a Green New Deal together, and it's not just about any one person, but all of us contributing to public policy. Wonderful to see everybody here and to, to, uh, uh, to see the full house that, that uh, has come to join us on this cold day um, in November um, here uh, at the Queen's Museum. I'm Reinhold Martin. Uh, I direct the Buell Center uh, for the Study of American Architecture at, at Columbia University. Uh, and um, I'm here, first of all, to thank yet again our many, many collaborators um, first of all, my colleagues at the Beale Center, Jordan Steingard and Jacob Moore, um, without whose efforts uh, none of us would be standing or sitting here doing anything. Um, and, uh, and also, of course, our colleagues, Deb, Adrienne, and Catherine, and their colleagues, uh, the entire team here at, at the Queens, uh, Queens Museum. Uh, and, and speaking of teams, the team of the architecture lobby, you can know them from their t-shirts. And, and I think there are buttons and, and folks from the AIA. And of course, uh, last but definitely not least, Kaza and Gabrielle, from whom you, you just heard. Uh, because really, I have to say, this was, this was really their idea. I mean, the idea, they, they came to us uh, from uh, the, the, the sort of 
uh, contexts that, that they were describing in, in which they'd been working uh, on, these, on these issues. We had been at the Buell Center for some years working on parallel issues, in particular the housing question. Uh, I encourage and I want to congratulate everybody here, a real shout out to anybody, I know there are some, uh, a few here, who were involved with the, with the legislation that, that the Congresswoman mentioned, um, that it's been a, a long time coming uh, to affirm the project of public housing and in, in principle in, the, in our society uh, and, and in practice now we hope there'll be more to come. And the person, Randy Abreu, who I'm uh, going to introduce to you now, had a little bit of a hand in that as well, and he can uh, answer your questions, I think. Um, but before that, just a couple of words. So the Buell Center, we, we, um, we're a research center at Columbia, so we're not typically seen in, in, in settings like, like this, but we have, uh, over the years, sought to kind of orient our work sort of both outwards and inwards at the same time, for, for, in other words, that uh, if we want to, we, to, to address and, and try to assemble, literally, publics, of various kinds uh, about around issues in ways in which we learn from one another, and that's what I want to I want to stress. Um, and and I know that you know as we learned this morning, uh, microphones like this one and learning don't always go together. People like me are used to spending a lot of time behind these microphones, but I know there are a lot of people here uh, who have spent a lot more time than many of us have working. Uh, you know on the ground, in the streets, uh, and in the housing, and all over on these issues. Uh, and, and so what we've tried to do here is to model something like a, a democratic um, pedagogy, a, way, a pedagogy of listening, uh, a, a kind of way of, of, in a way, passing the mic uh, to others and listening and learning from one another. And, and it's sort of really in that spirit of modeling a democracy that listens uh, that, that we're here uh, with you uh, today, and we're again so pleased that, that you've, you've joined us. Um, finally, the, the, last, the last little piece of, uh, of background on this is we hope that this, this kind of an assembly is, can be repeated over and over again, and should be all over the country, around the world. And so what we're also trying to do is to model for others how, and ourselves, how, how to do this kind of work together. So, so if you want to help us do the repeating uh, and amplifying of, of these, and also the debating, because uh, I know not, we're not going to all agree, um, then, then please join in. Um, but for now, I'm just here uh, to introduce to you somebody who has, uh, uh, has, has a lot to say on, on these matters and, and, and who will be happy to answer your questions, Randy Abreu. Um, who worked uh, for both the House Judiciary Committee and the Federal Communications Commission before President Obama appointed him as an advisor in the U.S. Department of Energy's Technology Transitions and Clean Energy uh, Investment Center. Currently, Randy serves as the legislative assistant to uh, Congresswoman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who, as you know, uh, at 29 years old, was the youngest woman elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from this very district, District 14, uh, here in, in Queens and the Bronx. Uh, and, and Randy specializes uh, <laughs> on the Green New Deal portfolio, and, and it's, uh, it's about that that, that uh, he'll be able to uh, uh, both speak in, in a little more detail and, and, uh, and take your questions uh, for a while as well. So, so welcome, Randy, and congratulations on the, on, the, on the bill, on the housing bill. I know there's more to come. So. I'm just going to, of course. Wow. Thank you, Ryan. All those were amazing words. I really appreciate it. Hi, everyone. It's, my name is Randy Abreu. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Saludos a todos mi gente que hablan español. And I promise to our translators that's the only time I'll do that. Um, I, that's the first time I've actually seen that video with the congresswoman talking about the Green New Deal in this video that she wanted to submit to the Bell Center and to Queens Museum. And after seeing the video, I'm thinking, like, you didn't really need me here to speak. She kind of handled exactly what we should have talked about, which is what is the Green New Deal? What impact will it have on people? And how do we get this done? What does a win look like? So since she saved me six minutes, I can just jump into the second part of what I was going to talk about today. And that is, what, what did we actually do? I know a lot of times we can say 
Green New Deal and something happened in DC and there was a vote and I'm not actually sure. And to know, to understand that maybe it's good to take a step back and go back one year and see how this all came to be. I'm from a far away place. Some of you may have been there. It's called the Bronx, New York. And that's where I met uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, while we were, we're both public servants, we're both in this for a greater vision of what we know our community in the Bronx could look like, but what so many communities across the country who face the same types of disadvantages that we have in the Bronx, how they can also improve. After the historic congressional primary win a little over a year ago, while discussing which ones of the big bold agendas and proposals that came out during her campaign, which one are we gonna move forward with? The answer was clear that it was the Green New Deal. And it was the Green New Deal because of what you heard. The Green New Deal is gonna solve an emergency that we have right now. The climate crisis is more than a crisis, y'all. It's an emergency. We can predict the impact of what would happen if a hurricane strikes, if, if a drought hits a farm town, but we can't predict the climate's patterns. We know this is destruction coming our way, but we can't tell which way it's gonna go. All we know is that every year it's gonna get stronger and it's going to amplify. And the longer we wait to take action, the more it's gonna cost us in the future. So yeah, we have to decarbonize the energy sector. We have to decarbonize the world. But understanding that that decarbonization is already gonna happen, right? This, we're humans, we, we adapt. We, we've gone through struggles before. If this transition in our energy system is already going to happen, who's gonna get the jobs? Who's gonna get the contracting opportunities? Where's the workforce development going to go? Can we use this as an opportunity to enhance our societies? Can we take a look at our communities and say, you know what, I think we can level up. That's what the Green New Deal means to us. And that's what the Green New Deal means to me. So about a year ago, after winning the general election, some of you may remember the congresswoman went to DC and politely visited Speaker Pelosi's office and called for a Green New Deal. And it was, yeah, you could clap for that, yeah. <laughs> so in calling for a Green New Deal committee, so let's study this, let's take a look at what's happening, how can we integrate the intersections of the climate disaster with the economy, with a history in this country that we can certainly do better. When the Climate Green New Deal Committee was not established, we didn't stop. It's not because we, we didn't stop because we didn't invent the Green New Deal. We were standing on the shoulders of activists and climate and environmental activists and advocates that have studied this, that have been on the front lines, that have been pushing for these policy solutions for decades. Some of you are in this room today. So we weren't going to stop. When the committee wasn't started, we said, you know what, we can put out a resolution. And we got to work on HRES 109. I thank the Bell Center and Columbia University. If you haven't grabbed one of the pamphlets uh, that really lays out HRES 109 and with some graphics and some great commentary, you should. You should also grab one of those pamphlets. HRES 109 is a resolution. A resolution separate from a congressional bill. A legislation. So a resolution, think of it more as a policy call to action. It was our call to action. Every member of the United States Congress can look at HRES 109 and see we established five Green New Deal goals. We established 14 mobilization projects that need to go on, and we laid out 15 guiding policies and principles to get us there and over to the finish line. Voting for a resolution, yes or no, doesn't really mean that's legislation. Doesn't really change what's happening on the ground. And between February and releasing the resolution and this past week, three days ago, we got to work on a piece of legislation because we knew that we can codify Green New Deal into law. The policies that are in the resolution, you can exemplify in legislation. And that is what we saw this past week with the Green New Deal for public housing. In the Green New Deal for public housing, you can see how the resolution is played out in real life. The Green New Deal for public housing is comprehensive. And 
establishes and encompasses upon several sectors of our economy and our society. And that was intentional. And a lot of what went into the Green New Deal for public housing was built by so many of you. We engaged with the community for months. We spoke with public housing residents. We spoke with engineers. We spoke with architects. We spoke with housing experts. We spoke with workforce development experts, worker cooperatives, pre-apprenticeship programs, unions. I mean, folks that just do weatherization programs in a tiny part of the Bronx. And how would this public housing Green New Deal help you scale up? How can your programs replicate throughout this community? We conducted, to the best of our abilities, a public assembly in crafting that bill. And the vision, the research, the thought, your words, so many of your words I can see in that bill, and that inspires me. And that is why when I walked in here today and I saw the separate sections that you've all come and built up, and you're having public assemblies for each one of these, I'm seeing legislation replicated right here today. And in that comprehensive building of the Green New Deal for Public Housing, I'll, I'd like to finish with one really cool story. That about 10 years ago, um, the Bell Center, and there was Professor Diana Martinez, who's now at Tufts, uh, put, started to put together what does architecture and public housing and the future of public housing look like? This is 10 years ago. I had no idea this was happening 10 years ago. As we started to engage with this project, our friend Casa showed me the books, the research that was compiled together, the creative ways that stories were being told and policies were being weaved with the politics with, with what is capable and what is possible in terms of engineering and architecture. While we had certain laws that we knew we wanted to touch upon with the bill, while we had certain building and infrastructure upgrades that we knew we wanted to talk about in the bill, it was this connection that helped tie the bill together. Public housing has almost a 100-year history, which could have been 100 years of promise, but because of specific policies, divestment, and privatization, we've seen the shrinking of this public good. So what you work on today you can bet it'll probably end up in legislation 10 years from now. So get to work. Thank you all so much for being here. And if you have, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you all. Are there any questions for Randy? While you, while he's here. There, there's a, is that a hand in the back? Oh, there's it. I actually have a little thing broken in here, so. Can you tell? I was scrolling and just came out in here because it was going into something to do with the cell phone. And there's a lot of information about just decided legislation to make. And you follow it. But you want to find a minority to vote for this minority to vote for it. Thank you so much for that question and the, the comment. I, you raise a really good point in that I think we should take advantage of the opportunity to highlight the importance of the issue, but also maybe be more comprehensive and holistic about our approaches to answer them. I also say even in the public housing piece, we, there's a specific grant section that focuses on, on people with disabilities and what would happen in a climate disaster and, and making sure that the, the exit and, and everything, so it was, very, it was holistic in that piece, but I'm sure even there, there was so much more that we can do, and 
taking advantage of that message would be great. So I'd be happy to work with, definitely chat after, but I heard Sunrise, and that's a great group to connect with as well. Thank you. Could a part of that question be repeated for those, I'm sorry, who were unable to hear, and also for the interpretation? Would that be possible? Yeah. Um, do you want to repeat? Sure. I'm able to do it with this mic as well. Hi, how's it going? I'm Steven. I'm here with the Disability Accessibility Team with Sunrise. And what I want to try to explain is that there's a lot of talk about uh, you know, just society legislation, of equality, of inclusion, of listening to different voices. But one large minority, the largest minority here in the United States, is people with disabilities. And I feel a lot of the legislation that's being built, the language that's being used, has been, uh, I want to say uninclusive, but not integrated, not as a prime talking point, more of a subcategory, even though people with disabilities are going to be greatly affected by uh, the Green New Deal, by this development. They have challenges with finding jobs, with limited income, with the limited savings, uh, not by their potential, but by government's structure, that if they try to save over $2,000, they lose all of their benefits, that sort of thing. Um, and I think there needs to be more inclusion and thought and uh, perspective understanding of people with disabilities when developing further legislation and, and further acts in the future. Thanks. Thanks for repeating and clarifying. I know this will take up from another question, but I do want to follow up on what you said again, because it is really important. And moving forward, what I've seen is a lot of issues that deal with the Green New Deal. There's something specific about people with disability in every issue. So the intersection there is even more relevant now, especially as you're bringing it up again. And I'd be really interested in, in working through what would a, a person with disabilities uh, bill of rights through the Green New Deal look like where we can tackle transportation, housing, in industry, um, communications. It, there's so many different issues. I think like working together now, using the policy and, and the framework to really dive in, maybe another public assembly, maybe, um, would be really exciting for me. So thank you so much for that. And, that might be it with so time. So we have time for one more question one here. More. This is the first hand I saw, but there'll be lots of questions later as well. Thank you. Hi, Randy. Thank you. And such deep gratitude to you and to your boss. Thank you. Um, and to youth with Sunrise and with Fridays for Future all over the world. Um, you know, I just want to... Um, really center transnational solidarity in our conversations. And I'm sometimes a little, I, I realize that uh, HRES 109 is meant as a conversation starter. Um, but there is language in the bill that is, you know, oriented to our capitalist system, to entrepreneurialism, and to, you know, the US as a competitive exporter of our, our climate solutions to the rest of the world. And I, I think, you know, it's going to be important moving forward that we really prioritize the needs of the Global South without pushing our solutions and our, our system, which has frankly caused a lot of the problem globally um, on those folks. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. I think that comment speaks for itself. It doesn't really need an answer. We totally understand. and. With the currently what's happening throughout the country, we are really excited to see as more people engage in politics and more people start getting out to register to vote and more people vote, that those voices are heard and, and we have a strong momentum to act on certain things. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it.